in the works of your hands. This is what we are here to do this morning. We are to give all praise to God who reigns above. Let's sing this song together with joy. <laughs> indeed. If you're able, please remain standing as we read from 2 Timothy chapter 3 for our Confessing Christ portion this morning. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further. 
for their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Father, you have given us many warnings in your word. You have told us exactly what to expect, and yet somehow we are always surprised. When will we learn to trust you? When will we learn to heed your warnings? When will we learn to trust your word? Oh God, our God, we know that we are here because of your grace and your mercy. We know that we are here because you have chosen us in your son to be worshipers, true worshipers. And so we come recognizing all that we have been and all that we now are. We are sinners. Father, at this time we will be moving into this portion where we will confess our sin and we know that it is good to do so, but even now we can be distracted. Let us not be distracted by our sin. Let us not be distracted so that we may truly and with penitent hearts confess to you all that is in our hearts and all that we have done against you this week. We ask, Lord, that you will bless this congregation through the elder you have given us, through our brother. May he lead us into this confession that we can lay down at your feet all that which has burdened our soul this week. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. As we enter into this time of confession, I would like to uh, con continue with this reflection on 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, considering God's warning uh, to beware of false teachers. As I looked at this passage uh, this past week, two things uh, stood out to me. First is that uh, Paul draws a sharp distinction between genuine and false Christian teachers. And we see that in verse 10, especially. You, however, Timothy, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. So we see here that Paul distinguishes between genuine and false teachers by way of an apostolic doctrine, a pattern of sound teaching, and also an apostolic pattern of life, a life of suffering. We would have to look elsewhere in 2 Timothy to see what terms Paul uses for uh, that pattern of teaching that the false uh, teachers have. He calls it idle babblings, um, ignorant disputes. Uh, later in chapter 4, he says that they depart into myths, uh, which is a false narrative. So they're using the same scriptures 
uh, that the genuine teacher would use, and yet that scripture is being fitted into a myth or a false narrative. Uh, at the time, Paul does mention one myth, which uh, some false teachers were spreading, which was that the resurrection had already taken place. Right? And this was spreading. There are many myths today. I, this week, I wouldn't encourage you to do this, but I did it just as part of my reflection. I went and read a sermon from a mainline Reformed church. The title of the sermon was, We All Belong. The text of the sermon was Acts chapter 10, where Peter encounters Cornelius, uh, and Peter learns that God accepts the Gentiles as well on the basis of faith and obedience, not by becoming circumcised and coming under the Old Testament law. But of course, the sermon was about how everyone is included in the body of Christ, even those who continue to identify with and practice sexual immorality. That, brothers, is a myth. That's an example of what Paul is talking about, departing into myths. So I have a few questions for you based on this this thing that stood out to me. So Paul is speaking to Timothy. Have you um, faithfully prayed for your elders? Paul says he prayed night and day for Timothy, that he would hold fast to the pattern of sound words that he had heard from Paul. Do you likewise pray for your elders? that they would hold fast, that they would not be ashamed of the testimony of Jesus Christ, that they would be willing to share in the suffering, the sufferings of Christ for the sake of the gospel. Have we diligently prayed that God would continue to provide for us faithful men who are able to teach according to that apostolic pattern of doctrine and life? Have we ourselves labored to know what that apostolic pattern of doctrine and life is? If you have covenant children, have you taught your covenant children the apostolic pattern of doctrine and life? Now, a second point stood out to me in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy which is in verse 5, after he goes through a list of the characteristics of these false teachers, he says, avoid such people. We don't hear that very often. That there are people you should avoid. Have you engaged in profane or idle babblings, foolish and ignorant disputes, allowing the cancer of false teaching to spread among God's people. And if you haven't engaged in those, have you failed to avoid such people? Were you arrogant enough to believe that you could associate with such people who behaved this way and avoid spiritual harm? to yourself, or to Christ's people. So let's enter this time of confession and use those questions just to reflect on your own life and whether there's something to confess. I will start us off with a corporate prayer of confession, and I'll leave time for you to confess, uh, and then I will conclude us. Let us pray. Almighty God, under the old covenant, you gave to your people your law. You gave to your people the prophets and the writings, which we read in, in 2 Timothy are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, and that these Old Testament scriptures are able to make us wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. 
And God, after the appearance of your Son in the flesh, Jesus Christ, you gave to your church the apostles as your authorized uh, messengers, your appointed teachers. And you warned us that in these days, many men would depart from the apostolic pattern of sound words, the, the true and genuine interpretation of the scriptures, and that they would turn aside to myths. But Lord, we have not taken heed of this warning as we should. We have not prayed diligently for our leaders and teachers of your word. We have not diligently worked uh, to understand uh, the apostolic pattern of doctrine and life as we ought. We have not diligently handed on this pattern to our covenant children as we, as we ought. And we, Lord, out of maybe a, a feeling of we ought to be nice to everyone, we have not shunned and avoided those who in our midst are, would spread the cancer of false teaching. Lord, forgive us. Father, you tell us that if we will confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hear this assurance, a pardon, taken from Psalm 16. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. Amen. Please stand. And let us sing, uh, in response to this good news of assurance of pardon, let us sing, Arise, My Soul, Arise, hymn number two.
remain standing as the usher comes forward with the tithes and offerings and we sing the doxology. All that we have, our daily bread, uh, the, the money uh, that we have uh, to purchase the necessities of life, all of this comes from you. And so what we give back to you uh, first belong to you. Um, we ask, Lord, that you would use uh, this that we offer back for the spreading of your kingdom, the rule of your son, Jesus Christ, who now reigns and for the furtherance of his teaching that we hear uh, in the apostles' teaching, that that apostolic teaching would go forth, that we would see uh, every knee bow, every tongue confess that you are Lord. Please, Lord, use uh, these tithes and offerings for that purpose. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of God's word, and children three and under may be dismissed to the nursery. If you have a copy of God's word with you, I encourage you to open it to Matthew chapter 7, that you can follow along. Our direct passage is right there in the bulletin. I'm going to start reading just a few verses early, just to give us a little bit of context for this. I'm just going to start reading in verse 13, and I'll read through verse 23. God's holy word. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Brothers and sisters, please pray with me. Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, this is your word to us. This is what you have given us that we would be made more and more like you. 
We need this word to take root in us so that we will beware as you command us to beware and that we would never find ourselves falling into the pit of becoming like those who are described in this passage. Father, we do not want to be cast out from your presence and into the fire, and so we need your spirit this morning to show us your truth by your word. Show us, Lord, that we are known by our fruit. And I pray, Father, that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my God, my rock and my redeemer. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we have prayed. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, I hope what I'm about to tell you is not a spoiler. I hope that it doesn't come as a surprise to any one of you. This world is a messed up, broken place. Anyone surprised? You all watch the news. If I were to summarize what I see as the biggest problem we face, I think I could do it with one word. Trust. We don't know who we can trust. We don't know what we can trust. Just this week, I read an article in which some people were trying to tell us that we can't even trust that 2 plus 2 equals 4. That, brothers and sisters, is a very big trust issue. In my experience, there is nothing more difficult than earning a person's trust. Trust is easily broken, and it is not easily mended. When you have someone's trust, there is a closeness that can't be faked. And when you don't have that kind of trust, there is a distance that simply can't be ignored. One of the most difficult relationships in which to maintain trust is the marriage relationship. And I remember one time in my marriage, a long, long time ago, asking Pastor Arch Van Devender, how can I convince my wife that I love her? How can I convince her to trust me when I say I love you? You know what he said? You can't. You just have to love her. And he is absolutely right. There is nothing that any of us can do to make someone trust us when we tell them that we love them. If our love is true, it will manifest itself in a way that cannot be ignored. And our passage this morning shows us that this is true of our love for God as well. We cannot simply say the words, I love you, Lord, and be satisfied that we have done all that we must to demonstrate our love. This section of our Lord Jesus Christ's Sermon on the Mount, which we will feed upon this morning, teaches us that true Christian faith is known by true Christian fruit. True faith is known by true fruit. And those are the two ways we're going to look at it this morning. We'll look at true faith when we examine verses 15 through 20, and we'll look at the true fruit as we look together at verses 21 through 23. Well, in this first section, our Lord teaches us about true faith. And first, we see that true faith will be falsely claimed by those who do not possess it. It's right there at the beginning of verse 15. Beware of false prophets. Now, by using the imperative, our Lord Jesus Christ is giving us a command. He is commanding us to do something. We must be aware of or be on the lookout for those who would try to abuse God's people by claiming some special gift or some special status in him. He calls these men pseudo prophetain. It is a, a combination of the word pseudo, which means uh, something that is not what it professes to be, something that is false. You may recognize that from pseudonym, right? That's a false name that someone uses when they write something. And it's a combination of the word prophet, and you know what prophets are, as in the Old Testament prophets like Moses and Elijah and um, Isaiah, etc. Now, the scriptures have often warned us about these false men who will pretend to be like true prophets, hasn't it? In Deuteronomy 18, we are warned about men who speak in the name of Jehovah, anything which he has not commanded them to speak, or also those who speak in the names of false gods. 
In Jeremiah, there are many places that speak of false prophets. Pastor Jesse reminded us of uh, that uh, section in chapter 6, where those false prophets who say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And what did they do? They led God's people into serious error. They led them into complacency and sin rather than into contrite repentance. In chapters 14 and 23 of Jeremiah, it says that the prophets are speaking lies in God's name. The Lord himself tells us that they speak out of their own minds and not from the mouth of Yahweh. So Jesus tells us that there will be false prophets that we must beware of, those who will falsely confess to have true faith. And he also tells us that they will have the outward appearance of being one with true faith. Right there it says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. And this is the real challenge for us and why we must diligently watch for the false prophets. Superficially, these men, these pretenders, will be indistinguishable from the real thing. These are not men coming into the fellowship of God and uh, running around spreading obviously false teaching. That would be easy to spot. We wouldn't have to be aware of that. We would see it right away. This kind of villain is crafty and deceitful. They carefully say and carefully do all of the things that Christians do so that the sheep can comfortably assume that everything is safe, that everything's secure, that they can be comfortable with this false prophet. But there will be something off about these sheep, won't there? Perhaps they just don't seem that interested in grass. Or maybe it's the way they respond to the shepherds, or perhaps they don't respond to shepherds at all. They will have the outward appearance of sheep. They would have the outward appearance of being possessors of true faith, yet that outward appearance will not match their inner reality. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. The word here translated ravenous can also be translated excessively greedy or plundering. And I think this helps us to understand the motivation of these pseudo-prophets. They expect to gain something from sheep. Now, it's obvious what wolves expect to gain from sheep, isn't it? Supper. They expect to gain a meal. And similarly, those who put themselves forward as teachers and pastors while lacking true faith are trying to consume God's people. As Paul puts it in Titus 1.11, these are men whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. They feign and fake the appearance of godliness and Christian religion for the purpose of gaining something from the people of God. Often it's as straightforward as money. They just want to get paid. Or perhaps they're looking for a job, which to them seems like a really easy gig. Now, there are some denominations in the churches where this might be true. You may have heard about a recent scandal in one of these denominations in which it was revealed that there are many pastors who are all preaching the same sermons, which have been written and distributed to all these different pastors for exactly that purpose. Those false prophets don't even need to pretend to understand God's word because someone else is giving to them all the things that they should say. We must beware of them. But sometimes it is even more complicated. Sometimes they're not just looking for money or an easy job. Sometimes men and women may be looking for an audience. Perhaps they're looking for a following. Maybe they long to be admired. They just want people to think well of them. Or perhaps what they really are looking for is people to control. There's a very real danger facing men who are called into ministry these days, and it's the danger of celebrity. Many crave attention. They want to have influence. They want the YouTube channel and the followings and the Twitter things and all the stuff that people would then give them a million thumbs ups and whatever, I'm, I haven't been on those stuff in a while. They want 
to be thought of as important. They want to be important to people. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, wicked men will pretend to believe something that they don't in order to get that kind of influence, in order to feel that kind of importance. Well, thank God with me, for we are not left without a means of seeing through such deception. For we are here taught that true faith will be clearly shown by the fruits of the life of those who possess it. We're looking here at verses 16 through 20, but starting here in 16, it says, you will know them by their fruits. The quality of the fruit will be clear, as clear as it is in nature. Look at what it says in the rest of verse 16. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Grapes grow on grapevines, right? If they grew on thorn bushes, then we wouldn't call them thorn bushes. We would call them grape bushes. Figs grow on fig trees. If what you want is a fig, and what you're looking for is figs, guess where you'll need to go? You'll need to go to a fig tree. And just as in nature, the true fruit of true faith will be consistent. He says, even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear good fruit, or sorry, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. You see, brothers and sisters, the tree defines the fruit, not the fruit, the tree. The fruit will always always, always represent the tree which bears it. There are no exceptions. Can you guess what kind of fruit an apple tree brings forth? It brings forth apples. If it brings forth anything else, it is not an apple tree. Can you guess what the good fruit of an apple tree is? The good fruit of an apple tree is apples. Now, not every apple will be the best apple on the face of the planet, but you better believe it's an apple. Now, if you have an apple tree that starts growing pears, that is a bad apple tree. That's a terrible apple tree. In actuality, it's not an apple tree. It's a pear tree, and that's why it bears pears. Now, uh, <laughs> Mrs. Bandy did say, yes, in case they're grafted in, and hallelujah, we're, the, we're that pear tree that's been grafted into the vine, right, the grapevine. But this is true in nature. God gives us this argument from nature so that we will see it. It's self-evident to us, and we know that it's true in human beings also. Even a child is known by his deeds, whether what he does is pure and right, Proverbs 20, 11. Or from this parallel passage in Luke chapter 6, he says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart... His mouth speaks. You will only find true Christian fruit being born out in the lives of true Christians, those who have been given true faith. And I want you to notice here in verse 19 that the presence of true fruit is consequential. There are consequences for not bearing good fruit. Every tree, he says, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. If an apple farmer has an apple tree that's taken up space in his orchard, it's using up resources from the soil and sucking up water, yet it doesn't bring forth any apples, what do you think he would do? Do you think our Lord in heaven would do anything less wise than that farmer? It pleases the farmer when his apple trees bear the apples for which he planted them. Oranges won't please him, or else he would have planted orange trees. Plums won't please him. He wants apples, and that is precisely why he planted apple trees. Is it not his right to choose the type of produce he wants from his orchard? And I ask you, does God have any less right when it comes to his flock to define what kind of fruit he wants and to expect it? And so those with true faith or false faith have no choice but to bring forth the only fruit which they're capable of producing. Verse 20, therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. 
If a person only claims to belong to Christ, yet they're not actually his, meaning they have not been convinced of their sin and misery, they have not had their minds enlightened in the knowledge of Christ, nor had their wills renewed, then they can only fake the appearance of faith. And they will not bring forth the true fruit that always accompanies true faith. Only those who have been persuaded and enabled by the Holy Spirit to embrace Jesus Christ for the salvation they desperately need, which is freely offered in the gospel, only they will be capable of bearing the true fruit which pleases God, the true fruit which shows their claim to true faith to be genuine. Now, this is vitally important for us to realize. We are not to take men at their word, are we? We are not to trust them based only on how they appear to us. Rather, we are to take them at their fruit. And we are to trust them only after a thorough inspection of the fruit of their lives. We must be aware that true faith will be claimed by those who do not have it so that they can try to take advantage of the household of God. Beware the false prophets. And our only way to evaluate such a claim is by examining the fruit that is produced. And we know that only true faith can produce the true fruit. So now let's look at that true fruit together in verses 21 through 23. True fruit is not merely in what we say. Look at verse 21. Some will confess Christ falsely. He says it plainly for us. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is different from those who are trying to pass themselves off as prophets or teachers to take advantage of the church. These are people who go through the motions of external Christianity, but inwardly they lack all of the internal conviction. They lack the true belief. Anyone can memorize a creedal statement and repeat it, whether they actually believe it or not. Anyone can read a prayer out loud, whether they mean it or not. And there certainly will be a true confession, though, a true confession of true faith. That is a true fruit of true faith. We're told in Romans 10, 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But such a confession is the fruit of true belief the true belief that's been planted in our hearts, which is itself a gift from God. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Now this false confession could be made for various reasons. One may have thought that they really believed, but were actually following one of those false prophets that Jesus warned about. They may sincerely believe what they believe, and what they believe is wrong things about God. They merely use the words of Christian faith, yet they do not have any Christian belief. Or one may claim the name Christian, but in reality they call evil what Christ called good, and they call good what Christ calls evil, as Elder Chase reminded us. Or perhaps they're given over to moral relativism. Do you know what that is? That's where they deny the reality of Christianity by confessing it as true for them. It's true for me. But at the same time, they actually believe that there are many paths to God, and everyone just has to find whichever one is true for them. That's moral relativism. They deny the power of Christianity by denying that it is true that we can trust it, and that it is the only way, truth, and life. It is the only way to the Father. Now, they might be saying the actual words of faith. They might even be quoting from the Holy Scriptures, but inwardly, they don't believe it, and they mean something completely different. I'm sure you're familiar with the Mormons. The Mormons take on themselves the name uh, of Jesus. They call themselves the Church of Jesus Christ, and they do this falsely. They claim that they believe and follow the teachings of the Bible, and yet it was insufficient, so they needed to write a whole other book in order to set things straight. Or you are probably familiar with Jehovah's Witnesses, right there in the name of their organization, 
They believe they are witnesses for Jehovah. And yet, even though they claim to follow God, they reject his only begotten son. And they reject everything that the Bible teaches about who Jesus is and what he's done. Now, those who confess falsely will not receive the promised blessing of God's covenantal loving kindness. They shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Hmm. God's word tells us what he's doing throughout the entire history of the cosmos. God is gathering all his holy people to himself in Christ Jesus. He is separating the wheat from the tares. He is separating the grain from the chaff. He is separating the dross from the gold and the sheep from the goats. We know that in Christ alone we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his own will. This is what God is doing. And the promised reward of God's covenantal faithfulness is not for the one who merely says the right words. Right? He says right there. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Brothers and sisters, there's no mistaking it. Jesus expects his people to do what he commands. Christianity, no matter what some may try to make it, is not an intellectual religion consisting primarily of mental agreement with true statements. That is not Christianity. Christianity is a real life of loving obedience to God's law and order. A real life that is ordered by his word. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Again in verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And again in verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Now do not misunderstand me. I am not saying that there is anything that we do to achieve or gain true faith. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that. The tree makes the fruit. Remember, no amount of fruit producing can change the tree. Good fruit only comes from good trees. It's never the other way around. We cannot produce good fruit or true fruit until we are first regenerated into a good tree, into one that has been given true faith. Yet Jesus tells us that many will try to use what they've done, use their works to defend themselves and to justify their claim of having true faith. We know that true fruit is not merely in what one says, but we see here in verse 22 that true fruit is also not in anything one can claim that they have done. It's not in our words. It's not even in what we claim. He says there, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? Some claim to have prophesied in Jesus' name. And this word can have many interpretations, but I think in this particular context, which is of speaking and declaring, the most helpful interpretation is that this is someone who's acting as a prophet. They're acting like a prophet. They are declaring what's true, that which only can be known by divine revelation. Now, simply stating that one has prophesied does not mean that it actually happened. Yet these false confessors will have the audacity to tell the Lord Almighty, you spoke through me. What hubris, what arrogance. For if God had actually spoken through them, there would be fruit and they would need to make no defense. Well, some claim to have cast out demons in Jesus' name. And this is a literal translation of what's in the Greek. And we're to understand that those seeking to commend themselves to the Lord as having true faith will bring as their evidence their lived experiences. And in their lived experiences, they have cast out demons. They have driven away evil spirits by invoking God's name. Now, I don't want to get derailed. 
I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. I'm not going to spend any time on it. Um, there's a lot to say about spiritual forces which are at work against the church, and we can talk about that at another time if you're interested. Or you could come to the men's Bible study. We're getting into the armor of God, Ephesians 6, shameless plug. But for our purposes here this morning, we have to recognize that even today, even on this very day, there are those who are claiming to do this in Jesus' name. It would be impossible to name all of these false teachers, all of these false prophets. You may know them as faith healers. You might recognize the name Benny Hinn. I can't remember his name, but the guy with all the airplanes, you know who I'm talking about? Cool. That, there we go. And then there's that other guy. Or, yep, I'm sure, I'm sure if we decided to take 10 minutes, we could probably name 100,000 of them. Sometimes it's even women. Sometimes it's not men. And they are claiming to do something in the name of God, in the name of Jesus Christ. And they almost perfectly fit Jesus' description of those who claim to be sheep, but inwardly are ravenous wolves, don't they? Now, I say almost because most of them are so extravagantly wealthy that they can't credibly claim to resemble the sheep. Right? Just by looking at them, you can tell oh, that's, that's something else than what is in this flock. Their lives are not ordered as one who does the will of our Father in heaven. And lastly, we see that some will even claim to have done many wonders in Jesus' name. These can be understood as miracles or literally works of power. And these works of power are those which the pretenders claim they have done in God's name. Now, this is the only claim made in their defense, which I think might actually be true. It could be true. For some of these pretenders may have actually done a wonderful, miraculous work, though they were unaware of it. Take, for example, the true believer who was first introduced to the name of Jesus Christ by one of the many discredited televangelist faith healers out there. With infantile faith, they may have responded to the Savior's name and to the words of the gospel which were mindlessly spoken though the speaker did not fully grasp the meaning of what he was even saying. Perhaps they read scripture. Perhaps it was put up on the screen, and that lost sheep heard the shepherd's voice. And hearing their shepherd's voice, they ran full speed into his arms and are now plunged into the joyful, the joyful lifelong journey that is union with Jesus Christ. Maybe that happened from one of these false teachers. They don't know, but they can't use it as a defense when they face the judgment. <clears throat> as Paul says in Philippians 1, some preach Christ from envy and strife, yet I rejoice because despite their bad motivations, Jesus Christ is preached. Those with the true fruit of true faith know better than to try and mount a defense based on anything in themselves or anything they have done. We know there's nothing in us or nothing we could do that will commend ourselves to God. If God himself has made you into a good tree, a tree of true faith, then guess what? You will bear true fruit. Now, this doesn't mean that you can sit on your backside and twiddle your thumbs all day long, waiting for the Lord to call you home. No. As Paul says in Philippians 2, you need to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Every Christian should be diligently seeking to bring forth the true fruit that comes from true faith. Jesus' response to the faith pretenders and their claims shows us what that true fruit is. And we see that true fruit is is a life ordered unto God's glory. Look at verse 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. If you remember those verses from John chapter 14, Jesus speaks of manifesting himself to and dwelling within those who love him and keep his commandments. In John chapter 10, he says, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. This is the opposite of what he says to the faith pretenders, isn't it? When he says, I never knew you, depart from me. Jesus is the great judge, and he cannot be manipulated or fooled. No one will escape the judgment. They are due, 
except those for whom Christ died, his true sheep. We will never depart from his presence. Nothing can pluck us from his hand. And Jesus' identification of those false confessors shows us precisely what the true fruit is. True fruit is lawfulness. Jesus rejects as being not his those who practice lawlessness. What's lawlessness? These people, they don't keep his commandments. They don't love his law. They don't love his word. They don't submit to his order, and they are in constant rebellion against his authority. Whether they call themselves Christian or not, that's what their life is like. But those with true faith will produce the true fruit that only they can bear. We will live according to God's holy word. We will order all of our life unto Christ's glory. We love his precepts and his statutes. We meditate on his law day and night. We're like that tree planted by the streams of many water that will bear fruit. Its its leaves won't fall off. They won't wither or die. We are committed to Christ's glory. We are committed to his order, his rule, his authority. We pray as he commands, attributing to him the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We trust his provision for us, and we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Now, you may notice I'm just going backwards in the Sermon on the Mount. That's because the Sermon on the Mount is the blueprint for the true fruit of true faith that shall be born in the life of true Christians. So I have to ask you, is this where your life's focus is? Is this what you expend all of your energy toward to bear the good, true fruit of the tree that God has made you? Do you endeavor to live according to his rule, according to his word, according to his law and his order? Now, this is the solution to that big problem I told you I think the world has, that trust problem. We know we can trust God's word. There is no doubt And when we are in doubt as to what we should believe, the first thing we should do is go to God's word. And we believe what's there over and above whatever anyone else tries to tell us. God's word is true. Let every other man be a liar. And what can we do when we cannot know who to trust? What can we do when it seems that we we can't trust the words of anyone? We can't trust politicians. We can't trust doctors. We can't trust people on the news. We can't trust anybody that in our society we would put the label expert. Well, we know what we have to do. We have to inspect their fruit. Is their fruit good or is it rotten? Does what they say fit with nature? In other words, ask yourself this. Is the organization telling us to trust the science also telling us that the science tells us that it's offensive to call someone mother and we should now call them birthing persons? Does that make sense? Ask yourself, is the fruit consistent? Remember, no good tree can bear bad fruit. No bad tree can bear good fruit. So can we trust the person who tells us we have to avoid all of our friends and avoid our family members, and yet in their own private life, they're not doing the same? Now, those examples are from the outside world, so let's bring it a little closer to home. Can you trust yourself? Can you trust your own confession to faith? Do you put on a sheep outfit when you know you're going to be hanging out with all the other sheep? Do you make sure that no one sees all that wolfishness that's still left inside you? Do you trust yourself when you say that you love God and yet you go days at a time without hearing his voice and his word or you go days at a time without praying to him and beseeching his mercy? Should you trust your own profession of faith in the Almighty God if you have not rearranged every part of your life to bring him glory? If you're still holding on to some part that's just for you, some goal, some agenda, some dream, can you trust your profession to true faith? Brothers and sisters, there is one thing that you can absolutely trust. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. 
If the Lord God has given you the gift of true faith and you want to be sure to bring forth true fruit, order your life in accordance with his word. If you don't know how to do that, I encourage you to talk to any of the officers here. We'll help you. We'll help you figure that out. Now, if you don't know whether or not you have been given true faith, then today is the perfect day for you. It is the perfect day to examine your own heart. Ask yourself, have you been given true faith? Do you believe that the God of mercy and grace has loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son to die for your sins, to cleanse you from your unrighteousness? Do you truly believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world? And have you truly submitted your life to his rule, to his law, to his authority? Again, speak to your elders and to the officers if, if you have any questions about this. There's no reason to waste any time. No reason to spend any more time not bearing the good fruit for which you have been made. And now we have before us the true bread of heaven, the sign and the seal of that which we can trust with all our heart and all our soul, that Jesus Christ, who is God, the Son of God, died to take the penalty of our sins. And having risen from the dead, he is making us new. He is making us true trees, good trees, to bear good fruit for his glory, for he is making us in his image. He will return. And he will bring us into eternal life and eternal fellowship with him who is our good shepherd. Brothers and sisters, please pray with me. <clears throat> Most holy Lord, we know that this is a work that you have done and it is marvelous in our eyes. You alone are the God of grace, the God who out of nothing in ourselves we who are wholly undeserving of your mercy, you have done all that is required that we can be transformed from fruitless, useless trees into good, fruit-bearing trees. And now, Father, as we ponder this sacrament you have given us and ponder this table before us, we beg you that you would through the faith that you have given us, give us true eyes that we would truly see your son here, that we would see Jesus, and that we would worship him. And in so worshiping him, we worship you by your spirit, which is within us. We pray, Lord, that you will help us not to be lazy in our faith and not to wait around, but that we would actively seek the ways that we can bear good fruit for you and for your glory. Help us, Lord, to order our lives to your glory, to submit to your word. For we know that this is the true fruit that comes from true faith. We bless your holy name and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as we prepare our hearts for receiving the elements of the Lord's communion, let us stand and sing together hymn number three, God of Grace, and I would ask the elders as we do so to prepare the table. God. 
seated. Now, I, I know there are some new faces in our congregation and in our midst, so I want to introduce to you, if you have not met him yet, Pastor Bill Dorfel. He's a teaching elder in the OPC, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, and he is credentialed, and so he is here and able to administer for us this sacrament. Thank you, Brad. This table belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is here, gathered with us to rejoice in him, to worship him, and to take part in this meal. He gives us eyes of faith to see more than just bread and the fruit of the vine. He enables us to see him who is the bread of life and the true vine. Our Savior gave this meal of remembrance to his church in every place, in every age, to be observed often until he returns. The meal is a gift of his grace for poor, weak sinners such as we. For as we feed upon these elements by faith, his spirit strengthens us to press on in our warfare against sin. The bread and the wine represent the body of Christ broken and his blood poured out. There are signs pointing to the forgiveness of our sin and to the nourishment of our souls in his grace. He reminds us here that he is faithful to his covenant promises and he calls us to more thankfulness, deeper thankfulness for our salvation. It is my privilege as a minister of the gospel of Christ to invite all who are right with God and with his church through faith in the Lord Jesus to come to this table. If you are resting in Christ alone for salvation, and if you are a baptized member of a church of Christ, that embraces the sovereign love and grace of God. And if you truly desire to walk in holiness, this supper is for you. And I invite you in Jesus' name to partake of the bread and the cup. But scripture does give us a warning. In 1 Corinthians 11, the apostle wrote, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. He eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and some have died. If you are living in unconfessed sin, I warn you not to take part in this holy table. And yet the warning is not meant to keep away from the table those who truly are repentant. This table is not for those who are free from sin, but for sinners who long to be free from sin. Is that true of you? Do you truly desire repentance as weak as that desire might be? If you are feeling weak this morning, Jesus understands. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It's good that we feel our weakness, for the spirit helps us in our weakness. He intercedes for us even here at this table. And he who searches our minds and hearts enables us to discern here the body of the Lord. And he gives us confidence to draw near by the blood of Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for sending your son to be the savior of sinners, to be our savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your presence here with us. Thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit to indwell us. And now we thank you for this bread 
and wine. Be pleased to set them apart for your holy purpose, that they might truly feed our souls through faith in your name. Amen. The Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Afterward, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for many for the remission of sins. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Will the elders please dismiss the rose to come forward? Has everyone been served? Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. Afterward, Jesus took the cup, and he said, This cup is my blood of the covenant, 
poured out for many for the remission of sins. All of you drink of it. Let's pray. Here, O oh our Lord, we see thee face to face. Here would we touch and handle things unseen. Here grasp with firmer hand the eternal grace, and all our weariness upon you lean. Here would we feed upon the bread of God. Here drink with you the royal wine of heaven. Here would we lay aside each earthly load. Here taste afresh the calm of sin forgiven. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the taste of your forgiveness. Thank you for removing from us the burden of all our sin by your blood. We pray in your name. Amen. Please stand and let's sing together our closing hymn. the Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace through the blood of Christ. Amen. Amen.